So many souls have tested him throughout the course of time. So many still reach out to him with broken hearts and minds. And every one of them will say, without exception, that they find Jesus never fails. Even in the days of old, he brought his people through. And then he came to show his love when he died for me and you. Amen. Oh, a lot of things and a lot of folks will fail you and let you down in this life, but Jesus won't. Amen. Husbands will fail, wives fail, boyfriends fail, girlfriends fail, your friends fail, your boss will fail, your co-workers will fail, your classmates will fail, your family members will fail you, Jesus won't fail you. Your politicians fail, leaders, rulers, they fail, Jesus doesn't fail. I'm glad that Jesus never fails. Amen. Take your Bibles this morning, and uh, Brother Daniel read to you there from the book of 2 Peter, and I want you to turn over to the book of 1 Thessalonians, and uh, chapter number 5 in 1 Thessalonians. And I'll preach to you here for a few minutes this morning. Um, 1 Thessalonians 5, and we'll start in verse number 11. I want you to notice, I don't know, <clears throat> what kind of Bible uh, you have this morning, uh, what uh, brand or, or what reference or any of that that you may be holding on to this morning, um, but most of your Bibles uh, at the beginning of a chapter, so a lot of them will give you a title uh, to that chapter or what it's written about in it, and if you look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 in the book, in the Bible that I'm using this morning, which is the King James Bible, uh, but the reference that I'm using, uh, it says right there by chapter 5, the day of the Lord. 
And if you look at the same chapter number 3 in 2 Peter, uh, where Brother Daniel read from a minute ago, it, said that it says as well in my Bible, the day of the Lord. And I wanted to give you that because it is part of the sermon uh, that I want to preach to you this morning. Second, or 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, rather. And uh, I want to read from verse number 11 down. And so uh, let's do it this way this morning. Let's all stand uh, for the reading of God's Word. And uh, here's what I want to do. The first verse here is the text verse, uh, or one of the text verses for the message. Verse number 11. Let's read verse number 11 responsively. That means you read it with me, and then I'll read down from there. Verse number 11. Here we go. Wherefore... Comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord, and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Now exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble minded, support the weak, be patient towards all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice. What's that word after rejoice in verse number 16? Evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit. Despise not the prophesyings. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil. Father in heaven, thank you for the day that you've given us and the opportunity one more time to be in your house, a place where we can come together as like-minded believers and worship you. May you be honored and glorified today. If there's any lost in the building this morning that doesn't know the Lord, I pray that they would receive him before they leave this place. And God, help us to take from your word and your holy scriptures what we need Apply it to our lives. Feed your sheep and your people today. We'll give you praise, honor, and glory. It's in your name I pray. Amen. And you can be seated. Two different books of the Bible uh, written by two different men uh, on the same subject and the same topic. And they use some of the same words. And there's a reason for it this morning. And that's kind of the direction I want to go for the past few weeks. Uh, I've been on a theme, if you so to speak, on the Great Commission, uh, things that we're to do after we're saved, and I've uh, preached pretty heavily on the go ye part, and we did one week on each one reach one, on making disciples, and we did another week on, uh, on a, heavenly, uh, a heavenly mandate for an earthly mission, and how we're supposed to go and make sure that other people are saved and know the Lord, and they're supposed to see us and uh, be able to see Jesus Christ in us, and the church's responsibility, and what we're supposed to do, and uh, those are, I believe, both of those things, uh, uh, we're supposed to spread the gospel of Jesus, amen? And this week, staying in that theme, I want to go to some other places of what we're supposed to do once we're saved, how we're supposed to live, and how we're supposed to be as church folk. Amen? Because we're church folk. And I've known a lot of church folk in my life, and some good, and some bad, and some pretty, and some ugly, and some mean, and some nice. And just like everywhere that you go, there are some that you get along with and some that you don't. But in the scripture, we are as children of God, church folk, as believers, we are given pretty clear mandates on what we're supposed to do going forward. And there's a reason for that. Paul once again outlines the various obligations in 1 Thessalonians that the believer has in the light of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those responsibilities are ascribed first to the believer's relationship with others and then with himself. There was many things that Paul uh, put in here and wrote in here in Thessalonians that line up. And the reason that I showed you uh, what I showed you with the two passages and why uh, they are the same. Because here's the deal. I read you from about half of the chapter down in Thessalonians. And Brother Daniel did the same thing in Second Peter. And here's the reason. Because before all of this in First Thessalonians 5... If you look at verse 1, this is what he says. 
But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you for yourselves. Know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness. Amen. That the day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad that you are not appointed to wrath this morning? But to obtain salvation, the writer said. Who died for us, praise God, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. And then verse 11, where I started reading from, goes like this. Now that I've told you all of that, the day of the Lord is at hand. He's coming as a thief in the night. There's going to be destruction. There's going to be turmoil. There's going to be people that think everything is peaceful and fine right now. And they're going to wake up the next morning and everything's going to be gone. Everything's going to be desolate. It is going to be a problem. Wherefore, Paul said, wherefore in verse 11, comfort yourselves. Edify one another, even also ye do. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. And then if you look over in 2 Peter, the same chapter number 3, Brother Daniel began reading in verse 14. I want you to look at the rest of the chapter. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you in both which I stir up at your pure minds by way of remembrance that ye be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostle of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last day scoffers walking after their own lusts. And saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since as the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of. That by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store. Reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of the ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. That one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. As some men may count slackness, but is longsuffering to us toward not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And here he says in verse number 10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye be in all holy conversation and godliness? Wow, what a word Peter's given us right here. Seeing that all things, Peter said, be dissolved. Everything that's going to come to pass. All that is going to happen. All that is going to take place. All that is coming with the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything. What manner of persons ought ye be? Whoa. Whoa. Verse number 12, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heaven and new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Verse number 14, 
Just like 1 Thessalonians 5, verse number 14, in 2 Peter 3, he ends his uh, prophesying and his uh, preaching and his sermon of the destruction that is going to come with the day of the Lord with a wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent, that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless, and account that the long-suffering of the Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul. Uh-oh, now he's talking about what Paul said. Also, according to the wisdom given unto him that hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Ye, therefore, you can take those words, therefore and wherefore, they're interchangeable in these passages, same thing, Beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also being led away with the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. Two different passages, two different books, two different writings, same theme. There is a day coming when Jesus Christ is going to come back. The trump's going to sound. The rapture is going to take place. All of the dead in Christ will be raised. The church is going to be raptured out of here. And we are going to go and live in eternity with him. And then pure destruction is coming down here. The tribulation is going to take place. And the things that we've been teaching and studying in my Sunday school class in Revelation with the mark of the beast and things that are happening and things that will take place with one world currency and all of the things that are coming together now before our eyes that are being prophesied and, and happening, it's all going to come to a head and great destruction will come to those that are still here that don't believe and then want to turn to Christ. Things are going to happen and begin to happen everywhere. And both writers tell us the same thing. Because all of this is going to take place. Wherefore, live this way. Why does Paul and Peter decide to do the same thing in both passages and give us the same thing in both passages of how that we ought to live after talking about the day of the Lord because we have a mandate here on this earth. It is not only to go ye and tell, it is also how we're supposed to conduct ourselves because Jesus Christ is in us. You ever got anything ready for a company coming over? You know how it is when you have something at the house. I like to host and have people over. My wife can't stand it. Got to get it all. Got to get the house. She's got to get everything clean. Everything's got to be spotless. Everything's got to be cleaned up. We've got a birthday party. Got one of the kids. and We got to have everything right. And she's cleaning and doing all these things. And I'm like washing the roof or something, I, I, doing something stupid that nobody's ever going to see. I'm cleaning my shop. And because uh, we think, but when there's people coming, we've got to get all this stuff done. And there's a re why? Because people are coming. Someone's coming to see it and some, someone's going to be there. And so you got to get it ready. And uh, how much have you got ready knowing that the Lord Jesus is coming back? Well, it's not just that though. There are other things that we do, not because he's coming back or we don't get things ready because people are coming. There's other things that we do or we don't do just because of who we are. Does anybody agree with me this morning? Um, a while back, a few months ago, me and Dallas had a conversation. He let a curse word in our house slip out of his mouth. Uh-oh, I told on him. He's going. He said, can't. And, and I know when I was a boy, what my dad taught me was this, that Dumases never say can't. We weren't allowed. It was spanking time. And so a few months ago, Dallas got the lesson. Can't, quit, give up. Those types of things are not in our vocabulary. We, we do not use those words. Uh, because you're, son, you're a Dumas. And I don't care. It, I don't care if it kills you. You finish what you start. 
Uh, me and my brother was drilled in us and ingrained in us as boys growing up that anytime you start something, you finish it. My dad even used it with fighting. He said, son, you never, you never start a fight, but you never run from one either. Hey, man, I believe that. So there's some things that it's just because of who you are and how you were brought up, and that's the way that it's done. I was taught growing up never to use the words. I can't afford that. You say, Brother Jonathan, aren't there things that you can't afford? Nope. Because I believe if I want it bad enough, I was taught not to say I can't afford and rather look at it as I can get there. That's a mindset. It's who you are, right? There's another type of people that anytime something hard comes in, they give up, they can't, and that might be who they are. But the way that you're trained and the way that you're brought up, and I had the conversation with Dallas that you're a Duma son, and so can't needs to be ripped out of your vocabulary and taken out of what you say, out of your dictionary. You, can, you, you, you don't use that in this house because it's who you are. You know what Paul and Peter are telling us here in the Scriptures? You live this way because it's who you are. Wait a minute, not because you're a Duma, not what it says in the Scripture. Because you're his. You're a child of the king, and so that's why you live this way. And that's why you do these things. And so both of them show in the scripture this right here. Jesus is coming. Destruction is coming. He's going to take his church out of here. He's coming back for us. Wherefore? Live this way. I want to speak to you for the few moments this morning on this thought and this subject. Wherefore living? Wherefore living? Number one. In wherefore living, you have a duty to the saints. Verses 11 through 15. Here's your duty to the saints. Edify them. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together. Edify one another, even also ye do. Engage them. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. Esteem them. And to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. Exhort them. Now we exhort you, brethren. Warn them that are unruly. Comfort them that are feeble-minded. Support the weak. Be patient toward all men. Exonerate them. See that none render evil for evil any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all mean, <clears throat> means. Brother Jonathan, what does all that mean? I'll give it to you like this. Esteem them. To esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. We're supposed to look at people. I know a lot of people preach that this way. It's how you're supposed to esteem the pastor. It's how you're supposed to love the pastor. I get it. It's how you're supposed to esteem and love each other. The church members, the believers, the child of God. I've heard, I have heard preachers preach it for them, the passage for themselves, sort of the way that they say that Paul is preaching it so that they would know how to treat him. But the truth of the matter is, he's different from them because whenever he talked about workers and laborers, he didn't just talk about his parishioners, he talked about himself. That's why there's nothing wrong with the preacher being up here doing work around the yards and on the grounds and at the buildings because I'm one of you, I ain't sitting on some throne above you. You can say amen right there. You ought to. Exhort them, exonerate them. I like this, esteem them. And to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. Unity among yourselves. Peace among yourselves, Paul. Why? Because you're believers. We're not supposed to be fighting and bickering. And I've seen it and you've seen it and we've all seen it. The social media stuff where preachers just get on there and go at each other and use the power of the tongue. And Satan is using men of, that think they're men of God to tear other men down and try to do things. And I've got news for you this morning that anybody, any preacher that you know and any person that you know that gets on there and, and tries to share stuff about some other preacher because they don't agree with how he does things and tries to tear them down number one they probably don't even know the Lord themselves number two they didn't take time to read all, all of it and see how much of it was out of context and just pure opinion that's being preached because they're jealous of another pastor and the truth of the matter is Paul said if you're saved and know the Lord you're supposed to esteem each other and live in peace among yourselves so that the rest of the world would want to know Jesus as well we preached a few weeks ago about the spirit that you have and the argumentative spirit is a divisive spirit. And it'll be a cold day where the devil lives before any preacher or evangelist ever stands behind this pulpit 
that gets on social media all the time tearing down other pastors and arguing with people. Why? Because if you're arguing with people on there, that's a, decisive, a divisive spirit. And the last thing that any pastor in their right mind wants is somebody coming into their pulpit with a divisive spirit. We need unity in God's church. Why would we turn the reins over to somebody that don't even have unity in their own life? Esteem them, engage them. We beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you. And are you in the Lord? Edify them. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together. Edify, we preached on that a few weeks ago, that you're supposed to build them up. You're supposed to help them grow. You're supposed to uh, be with them through all things. Uh, he talks about the fact that we're supposed to be with the feeble-minded, that we're supposed to comfort them. The feeble-minded that Paul is speaking of in the Scripture is probably not what you think. Uh, the feeble-minded are those people that are always fearful. They're always scared of everything. Why does he say the feeble-minded? Because he just told them what was going to happen. He just told them all this stuff that's going to take place. And those are the kind of people, and you know them and I know them, and we probably got them in this church. Every church has got them. The, those type of people, it's just in their blood and in their system, they're afraid. Now, I made the comment last Sunday uh, during the Sunday school lesson, teaching on the mark of the beast, that none of this scares me. I'm not afraid of any of it. None of it makes me quiver. I know that there's some bad stuff in Revelation with four-headed beasts and monsters in the, coming out of the sea and all kinds of stuff, scorpions that are going to have the heads of men and all this different stuff is in Revelation. But I ain't afraid of none of it because I ain't going to see any of it from down here. I ain't going to experience any of it. Hell doesn't scare me. That stuff don't scare me because I know where I'm going. <clears throat> but you have those that are fearful and everything scares them. And they'll come running to you, preacher. I saw this video on YouTube. <clears throat> and I'm pretty sure we know who the Antichrist is. No, you don't. You say, Brother Jonathan, don't you? I believe and he could be alive for all I know. I don't know. But you don't know who he is. <clears throat> Some are just fearful that way. But Paul tells us how to respond to him. Just comfort him. Nothing you're going to do is going to make all that go away. Just comfort him. What, what, what's the message in that? Be kind one to another. You have a duty to the saints. Not only that, number two, you have a devotion to the spiritual. Verses 16 through 19. Your obligation to praise. Rejoice evermore. Paul doesn't mince words there. He says rejoice evermore. Now, I said some of this is just because of who you are. You should rejoice this morning because of who you are. Because you're a child of God. We, my mom sent me a picture the other day. She had the kids in her car, and as soon as she turned on the gospel music, I'm sure it was gospel, right? Uh, as soon as she turned it on in her car, I don't think my mom listens to rap. I don't know. She might. Uh, as soon as she turned on the gospel music there in the car, uh, Bristol was in the car seat. Bristol's a year and a half, about a year and a half old. And as soon as the music came on in the car seat, Bristol goes. <laughs> like, she don't even know what that is. She don't even know what that means. But mom said, she, she turned around and snapped the picture because as soon as it came on, she said, as soon as I turned it on in the car, she just stuck her hand, and she does it in our car all the time. She, she'll be sitting in the back seat, and Liz will have a, something playing, and the kids will be singing, and Bristol will just go. And she ain't got no question. She sees the choir. She sees her sister's. She sees her siblings and her mom and dad, and that's just who she is because she sees it. You know, that's who we are. Rejoice evermore. We have an obligation, Paul said, to rejoice. Yeah, Paul, but what about all that other stuff that you said in verse 1 through 10? All that stuff about desolation, destruction, fire, melting, flooding, everything. Peter, all the floods you talked about, all the fire you talked about, all the destruction you talked about, all the desolation you talked about. What about all that in verses 1 through 14 that you told us about? And now we're supposed to, yes, rejoice evermore because that's not in store for you that's not what he has planned for you that's not what you're going to see so rejoice evermore you're obligated to rejoice 
Your devotion to the spiritual is your obligation to praise. Your obligation to pray. Paul says it this way, pray without ceasing. All this is going to happen, pray. All this is going to take place, pray. Brother Jonathan, what do you think about everything going on in the Middle East? And I follow a lot of Israel news, and I know a lot of stuff that is taking place and moving and going on and things that are fixing to happen with Iran that I've seen here recently that they won't show you on our uh, news networks and things that are taking place and all this stuff that's happening in Israel and things that are moving and uh, all that's going to take place soon. What, what about all of it? What do you think about all of it? Pray. Pray. It doesn't scare me. Pray. Your devotion to the spiritual has an obligation to praise, an obligation to pray, and an obligation to protect. Quench not the spirit. Protect from division. Protect from sin. Protect from anything that hinders the Holy Spirit of God from working inside of you. Why did he show us all this other stuff? What, this is why. Wherefore living is why. All this is going to happen. And if you want to be in your right mind, if you want to have the type of victorious Christian life that he has meant for you to have, then this is the way you need to live. You need to make sure you praise. You need to make sure you pray. And you need to make sure that you protect from all of the things that will quench the Spirit from being able to speak to you this is how Paul is telling us to live in 1st Thessalonians this is what he's writing to the church that is also for us your devotion to the spiritual and lastly your desire to be like the Savior being like him in verse 20 through 22 there's an obligation to prophesy he says, despise not the prophesying. I'm not talking about the TikToks of the guys that had visions. I, I'm not talking about those that think they see the future or the time travelers. It's not what I'm talking about. Well, what do you mean when you talk about those that prophesy and, 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 not, and, and making sure that uh, you don't despise them? What do you mean? Jesus Christ was a prophesier. Jesus Christ was a prophet. He said that he'd return one day. And we stand from the pulpit this morning and we say, he's coming back again. What are we doing? We're prophesying. We go out in the community and warn the lost that there's a heaven, there's a hell. When you die, you'll go to one of those two places. What are you doing? You're prophesying the prophecies that will come true and will happen. That's being like the Savior. But not just that, your obligation to prove. Prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. What does he mean? Check it with the scripture. You ever had somebody prophesy something in your life? Preacher, the Lord told me. The Lord told me. I can tell you this. If anybody ever comes to you and tells you that the Lord told them that you need to do something and that something benefits them, the Lord didn't tell them nothing. There's all kinds of people that fall for that garbage. That wasn't the Lord. That was greed. Hey, man, the Lord told me that you need to put $1,000 in because I need a private jet. No, the Lord didn't tell you nothing. That's why he goes from despise not prophesyings to this right here, prove all things. So, the ones that we are weary about, we better prove that. We better line that up with Scripture and see if it's true. Uh, before we go spreading that, we better, we better prove that. We better make sure that that's biblically sound. We better make sure that that's from the Bible and it lines up with Scripture and it's a promise from God or it's just some guy sitting in his basement with a big map on the wall trying to work things up and telling us the day that Jesus is coming back. No man knows the day or the hour. Even Jesus Christ don't know the day. The one thing that Jesus Christ decided to take himself and separate from the Father on. And you think you know. No, you don't know. Prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. What does that mean? That's your obligation to positivity. Oh, yeah. As a saved, born-again believer, you have an obligation to be positive. 
Hold fast to all those things which are good, Paul said. All the good things. Wait a minute, Paul. You just told us about all the bad. I know. Now hold fast to the good. I told you about what's going to take place. I told you about what's going to happen. But you ain't in the darkness. You are of the light. And since you're of the light, hold fast to all that is good. So there's a reason this morning why we praise. There's a reason this morning why we pray. There's a reason this morning why we protect. Because we hold fast to all that is good. Boy, there's a lot in this. I don't even have time to preach it all this morning. Your obligation to purity. Abstain from all appearance of evil. You can hold fast to what's good because you abstain from the appearance of evil. Oh, what do you mean, Brother Jonathan? Well, you're a saved, born-again child of God. You're not supposed to be like the world. You're not supposed to do the things of the world. And saved, born-again children of God have no business doing what the world does because you're saved. You're a child of the King. So you hold fast to purity. Uh, you young men and you, you young ladies, you teenagers and you college age, and uh, you, need to, you need to hold fast to good things and you need to make sure that you have an obligation to purity. I'm talking about purity in all things. What you, I'm not talking about just your uh, sexual purity. I'm not talking about uh, uh, just whether you're evil or you're wicked. I'm talking about how you talk about other people. The things that you say to people. How you treat people. Uh, how you admonish and how you esteem and how you engage and how you exhort and how you exonerate and all these things that Paul put in here. You have an obligation to treat people with pure holiness out of your heart. There's no room in a Christian's heart to hate anyone or to cast anyone out because we're supposed to hold fast to good things. In all of this, in Thessalonians and in, P and in 2 Peter, the wherefore living that I preach about this morning. Miss Hamilton, you can come. I'm done this morning. Your duty to the saints. Your devotion to the spiritual. And your desire to be like the Savior comes from one place. Surrender. I surrender all. What do you mean, Brother Jonathan? Well, Peter and Paul, they both told us about what was going to take place in the day of the Lord. And then they ended it with a wherefore. Live this way because of who you are, because of what he's done, because of how you know him, you're surrendered to him. Well, the church, you're supposed to be surrendered to him. You're surrendered to him because you have a desire to be like him. You're surrendered to him because you are devoted to be spiritual. You're surrendered to him because you have a duty within the body of believers that is to the saints. And it all comes from being surrendered to Jesus Christ. I wonder this morning if we're surrendered to him like we ought to be surrendered to him. Because here's what I know. I know that if we go down this list of everything that Paul said and everything that Peter said, I do not think that we could have everybody in the building raise their hand and say, this week I can check everyone off my box. I don't think the preacher could check them off all, all of his boxes. I don't think the staff members could check them all off. But our duty to the saints is to make sure that we can check off as many as we can and continue to grow and grow and grow and become better and better and better in Christ because we're surrendered to living the way that Paul tells us we're supposed to live. Here's what I mean. Are you praising like you ought to praise? Uh, what's he done in your life and you owe him praise for? Are you praising him? Did God get his praise from you today in church like he's supposed to get? Well, I'm just not that way, Brother Jonathan. That's just not how I praise and that's just not how I worship. Well, that's okay. It doesn't have to be how you praise and how you worship because it's not your praise and it's not your worship. It's his. And God wants it the way God ordered it. Rejoice evermore. Cry with a loud voice, he said. Are you praying? Here's what we do as Christians. We pray and we pray and we pray and we get answers to prayer. And then we don't do what Paul said. We quit praying. We don't pray without ceasing. Well, I got my answers. Got my answers. 
Well, somebody else needs answers. Somebody else is praying for something. They're grieving and stressing over and got burdens in their life and things they need. And somebody else is praying for something, but you're just good now. You don't have to pray anymore. Well, what about this one? God answers our prayers and then we forget about him. What do you mean? I prayed and prayed and prayed that God would elevate me at my job. I prayed and prayed and prayed God would give me that work, give me that business. I prayed and prayed and prayed that God would help my finances. Here I am, he did it. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? He did it. And then we quit praying. And then we forget about him. And then the finances go down. And the work goes away. And we remember, oh, i got to pray about this. Paul said pray without ceasing. Pray all the time. In need or not in need. Pray and pray and pray for that child. God, give me that baby. God, give us that child. Pray and pray and pray. God gives them to us. And then we use them to, as an excuse to get out of our service to the king. Yeah. Well, little Missy sneezed last night. I don't think I can go to church now. I understand kids get sick, right? Running fevers and everything else. That's one thing. We tend to take the blessings that God gave us that we prayed for and we turn them around and use them on him. And God looks down from heaven. And he said, you spent all that time praying for them kids, for me to give you some kids. And now that I gave them to you, you act like you can't even serve me because you have them. You spent all that time praying for them finances and that job. I gave it to you, and now you put it in front of me. Now it's important, and I'm not. Pray without ceasing. Praise all the time. Be surrendered. Why? Wherefore living? Wherefore living? We live that way because of what's going to happen. Jesus Christ is coming back one day. The rapture is going to take place one day. I don't know when. Maybe today, maybe tomorrow, maybe next year, maybe in 50 years. I don't know, but it's going to take place one day. It's going to happen. Desolation and destruction is going to come. Hell on earth is going to happen right here. It's all going to go down. Oh, the wickedness, Brother Jonathan. Did you see the Olympics and all that went on and all the wickedness? Why are you surprised? Satan's the prince of this world. There's no surprise there. There's wickedness and, and awful things and terrible things and terrible people. And they're all over this planet, all over this world. And there's places that you can't even imagine even stepping foot in. It's so wicked on this planet. There's no surprise there. The only difference is in that day, it's going to be everywhere. You won't gather with a group this big and not be able to see it. It'll be everywhere. Wickedness. Wherefore? Does that make you happy that it's all going to be wicked? No, but wherefore? Wherefore, I'll live this way. I know it's all going to happen. I know it's all going to take place. I know how it's going to go down. I believe what John the Beloved wrote and what he saw and what God showed him. I know what's going to happen. Wherefore? I'll walk this way. I'll live this way. I'll praise like this. I'll worship like this. I'll pray like this. I'll be devoted like this. I'll surrender like this. Why? Because God's been too good for me not to. Paul tells the church in Thessalonians that you need to be positive. That you know what your duty to the rest of the saints is. You already know what it is to the rest of the world. Your devotion to the spiritual and your desire to be like the Savior. Wherefore, all these things are going to happen. Live like this. Let's all stand all over the building.